This is Amy Poehler. My new movie, Disney and Pixar's Inside Out 2, is coming to theaters June 14th, and it's making me feel joy Woo! and sadness oh. and anger. Ah. Definitely some disgust. Rose! And I think a little fear. Ah. But I'm also feeling these new emotions like anxiety, embarrassment, envy, and ennui. Ah. It's what you call the boredom. Okay, that one was weird. It's going to be the feel-everything movie of the summer. Disney and Pixar's Inside Out 2. Rated PG. Parental guidance suggested. Only in theaters June 14. Get tickets now. Your brain needs support. And new Ollie Brainy Chews are a delightful way to take care of your cognitive health. Made with scientifically backed ingredients like Thai ginger, L-theanine, and caffeine. Brainy Chews support healthy brain function and help you find your focus. Stay chill or get energized. Be kind to your mind and get these nootropic chews at ollie.com. That's O-L-L-Y dot com. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. I'm Stephen Metcalf, and this is the Slate Culture Gap Fest. What even is Garfield edition? It's Wednesday, June 5th, 2024. On today's show, we discuss the incorrigible, the unkillable IP known as Garfield, the overfed Arn Sinek, who is not named Donald Trump, but Garfield, based on a comic strip by Jim Davis. The occasion being the new Garfield movie is just kind of conquering the summer box office, which may be more of a statement about the summer movie season, but we'll get to that. And then the estimable New Yorker writer Catherine Schultz has written a piece for the magazine about suspense, its nature in relation to fiction and works of fiction and film, but its surprising ubiquity and and really its poignancy in real life. We discuss, and then finally, one of the very oldest and closest friends of this show, June Thomas, has a new book. It's her first. It's called A Place of Our Own, Six Spaces That Shaped Queer Women's Culture. Very lucky to have her on the program today to discuss. Joining me today is Julia Turner of the Annenberg Center for Journalism at the University of Southern California. Julia, hey, how's it going? Hello, hello. I hate Mondays, but it's Tuesday, and you'll be listening to this on (laughs) Wednesday. So let's all have lasagna. Um, it's like uh, the hatred's compounding out like interest. And Dana Stevens, of course, is the film critic for Slate. Hey, Dana. Hello, Stephen. Dana, are you ready to talk the three-headed, in our instance, beast known as Garfield? I hope you are. <laughs> I mean, I want people to understand that I had to be dragged <laughs> kicking and screaming into this segment, and Julia is going to have to answer for herself before the, the throne of the Lord about making us all chill at Garfield material. <laughs> But I love the email to us. You sent said, "Oh, I took one for the team." Data, we all took one for the team. We each watched a different Garfield. Did, movie. did the two of you have to travel to a faraway theater in order to watch a one hundred minute Garfield movie that you paid for? I don't think so. I believe you comfortably watched an eighty minute Garfield movie in your home. I but there's the world's smallest violin, and there's. Then there's the one played by movie critics who have to go watch a movie (laughs) as part of their job. (laughs) Uh, The new Garfield movie is called rather passive-aggressively The Garfield Movie. It distinguishes it from from former installments of which Julia and I watched uh, them both. I think it's only two others. Now, there's really no way we would have done this if not for the question like what the fuck is even garfield i had no experience i mean i'd seen the comic strip in a newspaper Uh, maybe i read a panel realized what it was and, and moved on with my day but the occasion anyways that the new garfield movie in week one fought furiosa to a box office draw which is something of a surprise on both ends how successful garfield was what a kind of abject failure furiosa turned out to be and then it bested it this past weekend putting it 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 looks to me just eyeballing it i think the movie's in the black uh because it's done 150 million globally it's like basically kind of shaping up to be a hit um is this the latest installment by the way and what is it like to be ryan gosling (laughs) i mean you thought you were like part of the the pole in the tent pole for the summer with Fall Guy, and here you are, the orange cartoon cat beating you. Anyway, this is the surprising resilience of something none of us cares about. We thought might make an interesting pretense for a segment, so we each consumed a Garfield movie. 
Let's listen to a clip from the new one. In the scene, the titular feline is voiced by Chris Pratt in this one. He's being served lasagna. That is a running, I guess you would call it, gag in the Garfield verse. He's being fed it by his owner, John, played by Nicholas Holt. Let's listen. (sighs) Say when. Never, John. Bury me in cheese. I have two more in the freezer. Let me know when you want them. I'm going to go check on dessert. Oh, I apologize in advance. The eating you're about to see will not be pretty. And if you have young children, this would be a good time for them to leave the room. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I stand by, by my position that I suffered more than either of you guys did. And I'm not backing oh. down. Oh, oh I my. mean, did you? You guys are so uh, such jerks. Uh, I'll heal Garfield. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the reason, part of the reason I, I'm allowing myself to be Garfield level of cynical about Garfield is that, and we'll get into this in our conversation, but the more I read about the history of the strip and Jim Davis, who has been running the strip since 1978, the more I realized that he created the entire thing from a place of cynicism. It would be one thing if Garfield was beloved character that, you know, had sprung from his very soul that we were trashing, but he basically created this as a marketing and licensing opportunity. So, in, in exchange for him making all the millions that he's made over the years from Garfield, we get to mock it. Part of my curiosity about this is like Garfield is an ambient figure in the back of our minds, right? Like Garfield hates Mondays, loves lasagna. I mean, it's so simple. It's there. He hates the dog. Why? What's he doing? Why is he always on that shelf? Like what? <laughs> <laughs> because it's easy to draw. That's what. Well, yes, so we learned. But my kids really enjoy these strips. Like we we have a bunch of the Garfield at Large books, which were New York Times bestsellers many years over, which are just compilations of the Sunday strips. And they spend time with them and have enjoyed them. And the the kind of simplicity and economy of the storytelling totally works. Um, you know, they were more into them as they were learning to read several years ago. But the resonant power of the orange cat has radiated into my home. And it is true <laughs> that Garfield was one man's attempt to figure out how to make something that would appeal to everyone. But again, isn't it weird that the thing that appeals to everyone is a is kind of like nasty little cat? Like, you wouldn't you think that the thing that would appeal to everyone would be, I don't know, something that would make you go, aww. And instead, it's like, why does the cat even hate Mondays? The cat doesn't have a job. <laughs> like, I went back and <laughs> I went back and read a bunch of the strips, including some from the first Garfield at Large compilation and some from the 24th Garfield at Large compilation. And it's really interesting to read some of the early ones because the cat looks really different. He's like much fatter and basically uglier, um, maybe less merchandisable. And originally, Odie the dog shows up with a roommate, Lyman, who disappears somewhere along the early years. But as I was reading them, I was thinking like Garfield is this weird flip side of the comic strip Kathy. Like Kathy is also obsessed with eating and doesn't like what Mondays imply. She also seeks love for Lornley and she's obsessed with her weight. Kathy is full of anxiety and insecurity and Garfield has none. He's so unapologetic in his selfhood. He's he's devoid of self-doubt in this like kind of crazy way once you notice it. Uh, but anyway, I just think it's weird. Like, why is it this particular thing that is the thing, like that the marketing genius figured out would be the internationally licensable thing? I mean, I will say, and I, I don't know if this is true of the Bill Murray Garfields from the early 2000s that you watched, but this new movie tries to have it both ways in terms of, you know, getting the jokes out of Garfield's cynicism, but also giving him like a reuniting with his lost dad, tender moment, and a flashback to his cute kittenhood. And part of what really irritated me about the new movie is that it was trying to cash in on every possible audience pleasing thing it could, even if they were internally contradictory to the character. Yeah. I mean, Dana, that was characteristic of the movie that I saw, which has got a, yet such another generic name. I've forgotten it. I think it's called. Uh, I I don't know, the Garfield the movie, I think, from 2004, notable for having Garfield voiced by Bill Murray. And like the one thing you need to know about it going in is that Amazon Prime does not have one and a half speed viewing. I mean, it's 
an incredibly <laughs> painful experience to sit through 90 minutes of it. It's incredible to make a movie that, that is that short, 90 minutes, but padded and feels interminable. It's the bad movie hat trick. But I mean, I guess, I guess the appeal is the sarcasm is famously the defense of the weak in some sense. And so you have this creature who's entitled, you know, lazy, kind of, you know, I don't know, not just kind of, it's it's such a pain to like inert passive know-it-alls in a weird way that I find so incredibly grating and unfunny. Like, Julia, you're right, cats are sociopaths and there's something to be made of that. I it It's crazily repetitive and and supercilious and kind of you know wearying a couple of quick observations from the movie that i watched which is you know odie the dog is really cute especially in the dance off (laughs) and when a repentant garfield rescues odie from the evil shot collar wielding tv host i didn't cry you cried, so fuck you. <laughs> and the dog is played by a real dog in that movie, if I understand, right? Garfield yeah, is the only he's animated terrific. character. Well, what's, yes, what's fu- only animated? Well, yeah, the only animated character. I think every other animal is a real animal trained and then voiced. Um, but it's, uh, what's funny is I watched the movie. I'm like, the only good thing about this movie is this dog is amazing. And then I went and read the old reviews from 04, 20 years ago. Every single person calls out the dog, including some by name, like the real name of the dog, because uh, the performance is so standout. And one really quick observation, you think, oh, if I watch a movie from the 80s or 70s, maybe the 90s, there are going to be so many cringe moments because we've learned some things about you know how to even put it like we we were just so i think willfully blind to certain things for so long and now we're not anymore i mean i think there's something to that paradigm like we did make progress i'm here to tell you even 2004 i mean just the jennifer love hewitt she plays the love interest is kind of it's just I, you wouldn't do it today. I mean, she's just entirely this kind of, her job is to just look lovingly and reflect Glory Pat back on the boob she's who is the pet owner at the heart of it. It's really strange. Manic pixie cat veterinarian. Yeah. Anyway. Um, well, I am here to tell you that Garfield 2, A Tale of Two Kitties, which is an adaptation of the Mark Twain book, despite the title The Prince and the Pauper, was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Sucker. Oh my God. I don't know. It was a tight 80, which I think maybe speaks to movie lengths in the early aughts, but I think probably more likely speaks to the difficulty of doing the kind of animation or CG, like the extent of CG technology at that time was my hunch. And, you know, Bill Murray reprises the role. I did not look up whether the actual dog is the same, but the dog in uh, in the second movie doesn't get the same good reviews. But there's like a killer cast. Uh, the plot is that there is a cat that has inherited a fortune in Britain. And John and Garfield and Odie all go to Britain because John wants to propose to Jennifer Love Hewitt. And there's a swap there's an evil character uh, played by Billy Connolly uh, uh, who is trying to kill the rich cat to steal the castle from him. And then Garfield is just trying to prevent John from proposing to Liz slash Jennifer Love Hewitt, <laughs> which is ridiculous. But the the juxtaposition between the CG animal voiced by Murray and then there are an array of animals done practically with animal actors in the kind of barnyard menagerie of the country estate that is the subjects of the inheritance squabble up between the cats and humans are voiced by like, I mean, just the array of voice actors is hilarious with there's like Jane Leaves and Bob Hoskins and Tim Curry plays the other cat. I mean, <laughs> Anyway, it is brisk and mildly amusing, and it doesn't quite have it fully both ways. 
uh, Garfield is unrepentantly fat and lazy, uh, but he does just get a slight moment at the end of the film where he relents and agrees that perhaps John should be allowed to propose to Liz. So that's the only humanization he gets and it's, um, or whatever redemption of his cruel persona that he gets. And it's very lightly worn. I mean, it didn't, it didn't, you know, it was, it was not a great movie, but it was not, it was like totally watchable. Like five people at my house sat down and watched the whole thing. And I was like, all right, all hail Garfield, whatever. <laughs> like, I guess it's just, I, it's just so weird to me that this, it's like a fake misanthropy. Like what, like Garfield hates everything, but he doesn't really, cause he's trying to, cause he's, cause he's, his hatred of everything is like pablum that we're all supposed to like. It's just the question that Garfield raises for me is like, what does it mean about where our culture has gone that the thing that you would cynically make to please everybody is an unrepentantly unkind, sarcastic, fat cat. Yeah, I, I think the fact that Bill Murray did the voicing in the two movies that you guys watched, I didn't see watch those movies, but I did read about them for this conversation. And it seems like though the movies were somewhat critically reviled in general or, or mocked as we're kind of mocking right now. Bill Murray was, was acknowledged to be a good Garfield and the right casting for Garfield. And if you look at the appeal of, of Bill Murray as a character type, maybe you can see what Garfield is supposed to be if he were more clever, which is kind of, you know, just the indulgence of, of the id, you know, of one sort of laziest, greediest, most unwilling to stir off the couch sort of self, right? And Garfield's pride in those qualities, you know, his sort of happiness at his couch potato lasagna snarfing status. I guess that would be the appeal. I do agree, Julia, that it's sort of strange that it became this worldwide phenomenon. But honestly, I think a huge part of it is has to do with Jim Davis's sense of marketing. Like he wanted, he ha, he says in this it's sort of extraordinary interview from 1982, we read, so a few years into the Garfield strip phenomenon, that he tried to make a character with as much universal legibility as possible. He did, wasn't even talking about appeal necessarily. And he didn't talk about these qualities, interestingly. He did say something about well, I just wanted to focus on things that everyone understands, like eating and sleeping. <laughs> so he was kind of reducing Garfield to just this expression of basic biological acts. But but what he was really interested in is, you know, the jokes can't be wordplay because that wouldn't be translatable, right? They can't be culturally specific in any way. They have to be something that every single person in the world could have some mild recognition of. So it seems like what Jim Davis was shooting for was not, I want to win the hearts of millions or billions of people around the world, but sort of, I want to achieve a vague nod of recognition as billions of people glance at my three panel daily comic strip. And he did achieve that, but that is just such a, a sad bar for someone who has spent their life creating something to try to achieve. Yeah. If I were to write a facile think piece, it would be Garfield parallels the rise of like neoliberal, you know, personhood market man, self-maximization at all times, toned hard body, corporate warrior, self-maximizing, rivalrous. And, you know, it it does produce a shadow self, which is like, fuck you, this is ridiculous. You know, why take part in the competition I'm going to lose anyway? I'd like to sit on my sofa and just, it's the, it's the con consumerist shadow of all of that manic productivity and supposed self-actualization. And there is a, there is a part of me and I think everyone, you know, that just says, you know, oh, that's, I mean, it's so preposterous that it's opposite as a weird kind of maybe, maybe dignity. But in the end, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not going to write that piece. And I'm not sure I believe it. <laughs> no, but but it's interesting. Like, there's a little bit of like the Bartleby. There's a little bit of Bartleby <laughs> in Garfield. <laughs> like, <laughs> fuck you. I'm not doing anything. Uh, yeah. In, in uh, Melville's, Mel Melville's immortal line. <laughs> fuck you. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> Yeah, if Bartleby was stuffing his face with mail order, I mean, Ma delivery I mean, lasagna. All day do long. we know that Bartleby didn't eat lasagna? But but again, this is why hating Mondays is so fascinating because that's I it, not to indulge in your facile think piece, but but the implied hatred of a work week that is not there. 
is <laughs> is, faster is, than hitting is so is like crucial. It's this, I think it's the it's the sound of one hand clapping. I agree. Once you can solve that, you are you've achieved Garfield. <laughs> All right. Well, I think maybe maybe we've like I don't know cracked the Garfield you know uh, Da Vinci Code here. Who knows? Anyway, send us your theories. Shoot us an email. Dana, what is even the new one called? It's called. I think this the, the new one is is. The Garfield movie, and the one you watched is Garfield colon the, the movie. The movie, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> look, it sounds like if you're going to watch one, it should be Tale of Two Kitties. <laughs> it's true. Who cares? That, of course, is Garfield. He's fat, full figure. Ill mannered, and to think I created him. Summer is here, and your wardrobe needs an upgrade, right? Well, instead of a flimsy fast fashion haul, consider spending your money wisely on high-quality essentials that will last beyond the season. Quince is the place to go for quiet luxury without paying luxury prices. They offer a range of items like 100% European linen for under $50, luxurious silk shirts, I own one of these and I can attest that it is in fact luxurious, and Italian leather bags and 14-karat gold jewelry from only $30. All their prices are 50 to 80% less than similar brands. And because Quince creates timeless classic styles that won't go out of fashion, you will have them in your closet forever. I have a new item from Quince this summer, actually, that I think is destined to become one of my items of the summer. I'm going to take it on all the trips I take. It's on their website as the washable stretch silk tiered maxi dress. It's one of their most popular items. It looks great with everything, sandals, dressed up. It's something I'm going to be wearing all summer long. Quince is able to have the low prices it does because it partners directly with top factories to cut out the cost of the middleman and pass the savings on to you. And they only work with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices and premium eco-friendly fabrics. Upgrade your closet this summer with Quince. Right now, go to quince.com slash culture to get free shipping and 365-day returns on your next order. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash culture for free shipping and 365-day returns. Quince.com slash culture. Tired of not being able to get a hold of anyone when you have questions about your credit card? With 24-7 U.S.-based live customer service from Discover, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yes, you heard that right. You can talk to a human on the Discover customer service team anytime. So the next time you have a question about your credit card, call 1-800-DISCOVER to get the service you deserve. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. All right, now is the moment in our podcast where we discuss business before we go any further. Dana, what what do we have this week? We have a big item of business, Steve, this week, as big as it gets on the Slate Culture Gab Fest. Yes, it is now time to start compiling our Summer Strut playlist for our Summer Strut episode of 2024. We're not exactly sure when that that will air. It sort of depends on how big the list gets and how much time we all have to pick through it and pick our faves. But we want to start asking for listener submissions for the Summer Strut music playlist so that we can start listening to your songs and sometime, probably in late July or early August, come out with an episode in which we pick our faves. And for those of you who are maybe new to our show and are not familiar with the Summer Strut concept, Julia, can you explain it since you were the engineer of Summer Strut in the first place? Yeah. So this has become one of our most beloved annual traditions, and it was prompted more than 10 years ago by me moving to a new place where I had a walking commute, not my current problem. And I didn't have enough fun music to strut around New York City to. And I, uh, in an endorsement, asked people to submit fun music to strut around New York City to. And um, we got so many great submissions. And it's become an annual tradition where we kind of review the official songs of summer. And then we take your submissions and develop some unofficial songs of summer. And it's been such a great vector of discovery of all kinds of interesting music and bits of music history over the years. So we are very excited for your strutty songs. We have many definitions of strut, but we're looking for something summery, perhaps up-tempo in actual tempo or in spirit. And uh, yeah, can't wait to see what you send us this year. Yeah, a summer strut song can be almost anything. It certainly doesn't have to be about summer or specifically recorded for summer enjoyment. Ma- ma- mainly it should just not be a totally mournful dirge that you would listen to like <laughs> trudging through the snow. <laughs> but there are definitely all kinds of of tempos and languages and, you know, lyrical content that Decades. have made it onto strut. Yeah. Absolutely. And of course, 
It can be a, an old song. It can even be a well-known song. It's probably great that it not be a super, super famous song that we're all going to know because the idea is to discover new or new to us music. And this is really one of the ways, I think at least for me, that I discover pop music I didn't know before and then it enters the, the playlist forever. All right, so a few guidelines about Summer Strut submissions just so we can keep the list manageable enough that we can actually hear it. For one thing, please do not submit more than three songs. We love when people dump a whole album in terms of getting to know a new album, but we just don't know how to deal with that in terms of the list and it gets it so giant that we can't all listen to it. So three songs per person and please submit your songs by July 1st so that we have a full month to listen and start calling down our choices to do the show in late July or early August. So if you have submissions for the 2024 Summer Strut playlist, start putting them together. If you can send us an actual link to the song, that's great. Uh, if you can't, you can just send us the title and the artist in such a way that we can easily find it. And you can send those to culturefest at slate.com. That's culturefest at slate.com, our regular email address. We can't wait to start hearing your submissions and putting them into a giant list. And that announcement having been made, our only other item of business is to tell you about today's Slate Plus segment. This one comes from a listener question. A listener named Ivana wrote in to ask us about misremembered and misquoted lines and images from literature film. She was sort of talking about the process by which a meme, a trope from movies or literature gets adopted into the culture by people who might not have understood the original source material and might be either misinterpreting it or sort of recycling a, a false myth. She gave some great examples of that, uh, including the sort of misuse of, of the imagery of white whale and being in search of one's white whale from Moby Dick. So we are going to take that on and talk about some of our own favorite or least favorite misremembered moments from movies, literature, etc. If you're a Slate Plus member, you'll hear that at the end of the show. And if you're not, you can become one by going to slate.com slash culture plus. You'll hear that at the end of the show. And if you're not, you can become one by going to slate.com slash culture plus. When you're a member, you get members only programming like the bonus segment I just described. You get ad free podcasts and you will never hit a paywall on Slate, either in podcasting or writing, if you're a Slate Plus member. These memberships are really what keeps Slate going. So please, if you haven't already, sign up today at slate.com slash culture plus. All right, on with the show. Lesbians are people without a home, so says June Thomas right up top in the introduction, first sentence of the entire book, in fact, of her new book, A Place of Our Own, Six Spaces That Shaped Queer Women's Culture. The book is just out. June Thomas is as old and close, I cannot stress this enough, is as old and close a friend of this program as it has. And uh, that doesn't mean that I'm blowing smoke when I say, June, you've written a, a beautiful book, a really special Aww. book. And it has that virtue of being a book that it's incredible it didn't exist already. And so it's just triply amazing that it exists now. So congratulations. Thank you. Let me begin by quoting, if I may, just a little bit um, to give oh, if you must. <laughs> a taste <laughs> of what I mean when I say it's, it's beautifully written. Queer people, you write, who refused to see themselves as sick, who failed in their attempts to pass themselves off as straight, or who decided that the pain caused by suppression and deception was worse than the punishment they would receive if the truth came out, were forced to find new homes. June all works of history and criticism are somehow inseparable from the biography of the author, but this one especially so. You talk about a gay travel guide that came into your possession in roughly, I'm going to say, 1980, if I recall correctly. Yeah, approximately, yes. And that volume and what it suggested about the place that was to be your new home meant something to you. I'd love if you could describe what and why and what it led to. Yeah. Well, first of all, it was important because I had to buy a book to find out where I would be going, because I just knew it somehow intuitively that I couldn't just do what my friends were doing. I couldn't do what other people in the town where I grew up in, I couldn't just go where they went, because I knew that there was this separate world. At that point, I didn't know where it existed. I just knew it had to be out there. I was born later than a time when people thought they were on their own. I, I currently was on my own, but I knew there were others like me. And so I had to buy a book and I did. And it was, I was still in Britain at the time and it was a book about America. So it was all about sort of cruising grounds in Dallas and, you know, adult bookstores in Tujunga Canyon. They were not things that I could go to, but just knowing that they existed was so important and so meaningful. And especially, 
you know, this book was just, it was a, it was an absolute brick of a book. And it was mostly about stuff that was intended for men. But every now and then, in, especially in the big cities, there would be maybe only two or three entries that said they were for W, which meant women, mostly lesbian. And just the fact that there were bars in DC or bookstores in Provincetown or craft stores in places, that meant that there were places that I could go to. Maybe not literally, although I did go to some of those places. I did go to the craft store in Provincetown that I read about in that book. But just knowing that there were these businesses and play areas that other, that people had already started to create just gave me kind of faith and motivation that there would be some place for me to go. So it was hugely important. June, I just want to echo what Steve said. It's a beautiful book. It's a beautiful read. I love how y- your t- scholarship is deep, but lightly worn. It's like a very, it's like a romp through these spaces. And it's not a romp because it's ignoring big serious questions about um, why these spaces worked or didn't or the persecution that people faced. But anyway, it's terrific. Congrats. And, you know, I, of course, remember some of the genesis of this project with your uh, series on on lesbian bars uh, or gay bars that you did for Slate back in 2011. Um, And so I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about the process of identifying the other five spaces, you know, as you expanded that work out into this book you know, it's structured around different different uh, queer spaces for women, the softball team, the feminist bookstore. Was it always obvious that those were the six? You know, how, how did you end up determining the scope of your exploration? Well, Julia, as you said, the germ of the story in a way, the germ of the book was indeed in a series I wrote for Slate, which you and John Swansburg edited beautifully and helped shape, that was about bars. And to be honest with you, I got a bit sick about how everything about queer people and especially about lesbians always seems to be about bars, you know, the disappearance of the lesbian bar. And I just, you know, that not to dismiss that, that's a real thing, but that's not the only places we go. So I really wanted to talk about the places that had been and are, you know, they're not all in the past tense by any means, the places that I enjoy. And so... The others are the Feminist Bookstore, which really for me was, I know you shouldn't play favorites, but I have to play favorite because that was my favorite. And it was a store, you know, it was a bookstore. We know what bookstores are, right? But this movement that that we were part of, the feminist movement, the lesbian feminist movement, it was, as somebody so beautifully wrote, fueled by texts, which is a very difficult thing to say, but is so true, you know, that especially in the first year of the women's movements, there was a book that came out after it called Notes from the First Year. Then the next year there was Notes from the Second Year. Like we were obsessed with documenting, you know, the ideas that people were discussing, the the new developments. And the bookstores really were where the new ideas could be found in magazines and books, but also where you could find the music and you could find out about concerts. And because they developed effectively into community centers where you could find out about where the bars were, where if you wanted to go bird watching, where, where the you know lesbian bird watchers might be. And so that I really wanted to just remind people how feminist bookstores used to be and also tell them that they're reviving now. There's been a whole bunch of them open in recent years. Softball was one that I, it was one that I have very little personal connection to. I am not a softball guy. I don't really like to be outside. I don't really like to be in the sun. But I knew that this was a very important kind of camaraderie for a lot of women and that there were also, you know, stories of activism that had happened on the softball diamond. And when I went to a game, I thought, oh my God, what? why have I not been around here more? Because it is so, it's a place to have fun, which feels really, really important. Lesbian Land, which was a series of separatist communes that mostly started in the 70s and was a very difficult way of life that, that women were trying. They were just so sick of the mainstream culture that they just didn't want to deal with it anymore. They were going to make a place of their own. 
And they went off to remote places because they didn't want to be, they wanted to get as far away from men as possible uh, and the straight world in general. And so they were quite remote, but they were, you know, the things that they made were astonishing. And then I wanted people to know about what they had made and what they, the struggles that they had, because the struggles were immense. Feminist toy stores are a place that, you know, I, I'm a little bit of a prude, so it was almost hard for me to write that chapter. Every single time I was researching, I would be at a website. It's like yeah, there have to be at least 10 sex toys on every web page that is talks. <laughs> and it was like, oh, my goodness, I'm so. But um, but also it was very clear to me that sexual liberation is an integral part of women's liberation, of queer liberation. We had to learn how to have sex because it sure, certainly was not. Uh, you know, taught in school. And those places were incredibly, I mean, some of the most transformative spaces because they changed actually the entire adult industry. And then vacation destinations, because we are not a mind, sorry, we are not a majority in any place in the world, except kind of sort of in a few vacation destinations for a few weeks every year. And even though they're quite privileged places, it's still such a wonderful feeling to experience that you really don't get to experience anywhere else of our culture being the default. And that felt really important. My question has to do with the economics of, of lesbian businesses, which you get into in the bars, in the bookstores. I mean, I don't know how you want to frame this exactly, but I was really fascinated, for example, of, of the lawsuit that the Amazon bookstore, the original Amazon bookstore, which you call Amazon.com, which I love, a Minneapolis feminist bookstore that I think existed for 25 years or so, right? Before they went to court with Jeff Bezos, right? I don't know if you want to talk about that lawsuit or about the economics of lesbian bars, but you talk a lot about the difficulty of survival of these businesses, in part just because they're niche businesses that cater to a, a smaller community by definition. But yeah, tell us something about the economics of lesbian business. Well, as you say, there is this initial challenge that it's a relatively small community. Let's say 5%. No one knows, but let's say 5%. Well, uh, you know, that it's really hard to kind of plan a business, to build a business, if you think you have a ceiling for how many people are going to come through the door. And the fact is that in most, not all, but for example, in bars, it, this is changing now, but, you know, certainly back in the 70s, 80s, if you were going to go to a lesbian bar, you wanted it to be a lesbian bar. You didn't want a bunch of straight men in there. And so, you know, it, it's not only that you you can't grow beyond, uh, you know, a certain percentage. There's a limit. Also, women have less money than men. Women also, and I'm maybe only speaking for myself, are rather kind of a bit more hermity than men. They tend to go out less than men. So there are those issues. One of the things I really, it was really important to me, and, and Amazon was an example, Amazon not come, that is, is it's if these businesses failed. And I think in a very key way, they didn't fail. They just didn't last forever. But if they failed, it wasn't because they didn't try hard, because they lacked innovation, because they lacked creativity. It was not that. They, you know, as I, as I explain in perhaps more detail than some people would want, like all of the things that Amazon Women's Bookstore tried over the years and to bring women in, all of the experimentation, all of the programs that said they set up that were, you know, yes, they were trying to, uh, you know, help the business succeed, but they also were doing programs to, you know, for example, uh, help new readers or, you know, have, have reading groups. It was, yes, to sell books in the second case, but it was also to build community and to get those books and records and magazines into women's hands. And it, Amazon is a case that was so extreme because, as you say, after, uh, a few years after Amazon.com started, they just had this problem where people were confusing the two. And to be clear, as you said, Amazon Women's Bookstore had been in business for more than 25 years when Amazon.com started. And the, the the physical bookstore was just constantly was losing business because people were, you know, this at one point during one of the holiday seasons, the women at Amazon Women's Bookstore said, I just felt like I was working for Amazon.com. There were so many people who were calling about problems they were having with Amazon.com, et cetera. And it was really hurting 
their kind of good reputation. And so they they did sue and, uh, well, you know, Goliath usually wins. Goliath won in this case. But it is so hard for feminist businesses to, to succeed in the, you know, to compete against Goliath, let's say, for all the reasons I expressed before, but also because they are mission driven and they want to cooperate and they do cooperate. And, you know, the, the customers honestly are very hard to please. We, we tend to ask much more of our own businesses than from mainstream businesses. And the, the point I guess I wanted to make was just that to the extent that they failed, it wasn't because they weren't creative and inventive uh, and innovative. It was just that it's, it, it's really, really hard to beat Goliath. Mm. You talk in the section about bars, the mob, you know, which exists in a parasitical mm-hmm. way to find points of, of supposed weakness and vulnerability and then exploit them ruthlessly, how integral they were <laughs> for better, <laughs> but mm-hmm. almost entirely for worse to the gay uh, uh, bar scene and the lesbian bar scene early on. But do you know, I want to switch up a little bit. It seems to me how much of what you describe as a legacy of two things, the, the closet, which has changed so radically since the 90s and the early aughts, and uh, the rise of the internet that turns spaces into virtual spaces, communities into virtual communities. What do you make of those? Oof, I mean, that's a great question, also a big question. I mean, I guess just to sort of talk about the closet, you know, sometimes we talk about the closet as if people, it was a place that people, you know, loved to be in and they just were so reluctant to come out. And just to remember that it was a vile place that people were forced into, that they they were forced into it because if they left this, you know, this imaginary room that, that, that supposedly provides safety, but also forced them to lie and to deceive and to potentially cut themselves off from pleasure and connection, they faced danger. And that danger was very real. It wasn't, you know, some some strange idea. It was that they would lose their job. There was a very good chance they would lose their job. That if they had kids, they almost definitely would lose their kids. That, you know, people would be scandalized and, you know, maybe the, their family would, you know, break from them. So the closet, you know, which can sound almost comforting, was, you know, just a horrible, horrific place, a prison. And so, yeah, getting out of that closet was very important and was very difficult because it was because it represented danger and you know going to those places those few places that you might hear of even if they were kind of crummy was so important because they were the only places that you could find this thing that you needed so much that you would put yourselves in danger for the internet has changed things it's transformed things it's made it much easier for ideas to spread quickly, which is hugely important. And I think why we are seeing so, such a, a much more rapid evolution these days of our ideas of gender and sort of, you know, conversations and debates about gender and sexuality. But also in terms of spaces, I don't want to diss it, <laughs> heaven forbid, but it it's it's kind of acts of transformation, many of which have been very helpful. You know, the fact that if you are alone in in a, a small town, you there's a possibility, there's a good possibility, if you can get access to the internet, that you will find other people, that you you will find community and you know reassurance and connection, and you won't be on your own. But it's not the same. You know, you are effectively searching, and there's very little serendipity on the internet. So those kind of that feeling where you, you know, you, you wander in, you meet someone, that person tells you about another thing that's actually much more interesting to you. You'd rather be bird watching than, than in the bar. And, but you find out about this bird watching thing because you went into the bar. Like that, that is, is harder to find on the internet. And I do think there is, you know, and I speak now as an absolute hermit, but I do think that, you know, being in the same space together is is really powerful. I love two things about the, your approach to that in the book, June. One is I think your constitutional hermitness kind of makes you the perfect person to write this book. Like you might think, why did the hermit write the book about in-person gathering spaces? But in fact, it gives you like a little bit of the like just landed from Mars ability to kind of <laughs> hold the whole thing up and and look at it fresh. That is part of what makes your analysis so acute, I think. And you know, there is is so much in here that applies beyond 
lesbian spaces too, to just the role that the internet has played in making it easier to find people with whom you share affinities, but also distancing you from the types of places that might have opened you up to different worlds and different people. June, before we go out, I just want to mention to listeners who love your voice, because I know we always get emails when you're on our show about people absolutely loving your Mancoustrian accent, that if you want to hear this book read in June's voice, which I tried to do as I was reading the book, I wanted to have the um, the dual experience of, of audio and print at the same time. And I discovered that in an unusual timing glitch, your audiobook is not coming out to the end of July. So I just want people to know that it is there, it is coming, but you can't get it right now in, in, in Audible Bookstore and other places. Yeah, thank you for pointing out. Uh, so yes, you will be able to hear all about bookstores and books and also <laughs> some people who were kooks. Yeah. And I want to be clear, when I say they were kooks, I mean it with a C, not a K. Wait, Dana, you just said men. Mancus- yeah, I know. <laughs> Is it it's not Mancunium? Uh, Mancunium? Oh, sorry. It's, it's that, I think it's a, someone from Manchester who also rides horses. <laughs> I was so proud that I remembered it was an unusual word, and then You're I made, made a word up. I, I usually correct, but it was such a good word that I didn't want It was to. very charming. <laughs> uh, all right. On that note, June Thomas. Can we, guys, can we just sort of say oldest and closest friend of the program? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, we got to do it. It's the it's it's a bridge too wow. close. Um, best best Oxfam. friend of the podcast. <laughs> yes, there we go. June, it's wow. just a delight. And congratulations. What what a, a what an achievement, really. Thank you so much. Honestly, the book's cool, but being best of all. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes, it is. A place of our own. Six spaces that shaped queer women's culture. By, of course, June Thomas. It is a cool book. All right. Talk to you soon, I hope, June. Thank you so much. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the only credit card designed for iPhone. It gives you up to 3% daily cash back on every purchase. It's real cash that never expires or loses value. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City Branch, subject to credit approval. Daily cash is available via Apple Cash Card issued by Green Dot Bank member FDIC or as a statement credit. Terms and more at AppleCard.com. This episode is brought to you by Fail Better, David Duchovny's new podcast with Lemonada Media. On Fail Better, David, who has experienced both low and high profile failures throughout his life, explores the vast world of failure, how it holds us back, propels us forward, and ultimately shapes our lives. Each week he will chat with guests like Ben Stiller, Bette Midler, and more about how our perceived failures have actually been our biggest catalysts for growth, revelation, and even healing. Through these conversations, he hopes listeners can learn how to embrace the opportunity of failure and fail better together. Fail Better is out now wherever you get your podcasts. And so lately I've been thinking, right, so really the wonderful writer Catherine Schultz in The New Yorker, in the context of life about something I have thought about for years in the context of literature, the structure, function, and strange pleasures of suspense, the occasion for Schultz thinking about it is her partner became pregnant and the waiting uh, therein, of course, is highly suspenseful. Then she goes on to argue that despite having a reputation as like kind of down market and tawdry, it was associated in the 19th and early 20th century with the genre of fiction. She says, quote, such opprobrium rests on a logical flaw. Yeah, tawdry liter- liter- uh, literature is full of suspense, but virtually every other kind of literature is too. And then she goes on from there to argue that really suspense is a universal feature of human language and experience. We're anticipating machines, as she quotes the philosopher Daniel Dennett. Um, Julia, let me start with you. I mean, first of all, yet another you know uh, elegant turn from Catherine Schultz, um, but a curious essay. And when you really look at its structure, it's wonderful, right? Begins with an anecdote broadens out, broadens out, broadens out, and finally she's talking about the ontology of being human. <laughs> And yet you never feel, you know, flogged by someone's erudition. Nice job, right? Yeah. Well, I loved it because I am a fan of suspense as a reader and a fan of plot, you know, in the end. I do like to read detective novels. I don't like to read horror, horror, but I do like to read kind of mystery and detective. And it's interesting to think through what that impulse is 
to want to know what happens next. And interestingly to me, she did not discuss the dynamic that I find most compelling about it, which is just that it, the role that it plays in keeping your mind from wandering. Like to me, the power of suspense in a text is that it focuses your attention, right? It, it pulls you forward. It keeps you, keeps you going. And it also keeps you from going away. It keeps you from thinking about other things, wondering other questions, um, sort of the power of the puzzle that your mind wants to know the resolution to. And so I've, I have found suspense books particularly compelling in moments of my life where my brain is particularly frazzled. And so it was interesting to come into it with that understanding of the power of suspense and then see her point out that, you know, in fact, suspense is integral to every good bit of literature, if you think about it, and then also to zoom out and apply it to life. And I'm curious what you guys made of applying it to life. She talks about anticipation and dread and other kinds of kind of watchful waiting and wondering and hoping for what might happen next that meet our days. And although I really enjoyed the essay uh, and found it provocative, I don't know that I experienced those things in quite the same way that I experienced suspense in a text. So I was very curious to hear what you guys made of, of this exploration. But I think that's part of her point. I mean, I think I, what I loved about it, the way she bounced from literature and film and, you know, fictive representations of suspense to the human experience of suspense is that they have kind of completely different natures that that in a for one thing in in the human version of suspense you always want things to come out right right i mean she 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 sort of says the human version of suspense is basically hoping that your future or the future whoever you're worrying about will be okay and that's not necessarily the case of course in watching a film noir right you might kind of wish for the worst to happen or at the very least want to see the bad guys get their come up and it's just it's a different structure when you have a sort of fiction that you can impose your own outside moral view on as opposed to a subjective experience that you just simply wish will turn out okay. And that was why I thought that the pregnancy metaphor, which isn't the only real life version of suspense she talks about, but it's kind of the structuring one, uh, was really wonderful. The text that this reminded me of the most is was Catherine Schultz's book from 2010, which I'm sure I've endorsed or talked about on the show before because it's so good. Being Wrong, have either of you or both of you read that book, her first book? Yeah. And and parts of, you know, she she did explore some of those themes in a series of essays for Slate. It's kind of similar, I think, in the sense that it it is it's a person. It feels like a person thinking <laughs> about a big question in in that case, in the case of the book being wrong about sort of error and the role of error in human discovery, and just letting her mind expand as as much as she wants to. You know, sort of going back to you know even imagining well, how did humans first sort of figure out start to figure out astronomy and how the stars moved? Right. I mean, in order to do that with as little information, scientific information as was available at the time you would have to be wrong over and over again. And that's sort of what the book is about, is the path through error to, to discovery. And, and this is a very different question, but it's a, it's a similar kind of ex- expansiveness of thinking that, that I love about Catherine Schultz's writing. For example, and Steve, I thought that you would be interested in this part in particular, um, she takes it down to the sentence level. And I loved when she took various first sentences of novels, including the first sentence of a Stephen King novel, um, and talked about how a, a sentence doesn't have to plant the elements of suspense, like it was a dark and stormy night, in order to get you feeling suspense. And that at a very basic level, every writer has to deal with how to make the next sentence interesting to read, right? That each sentence is an attempt to get you to read the next one. Yeah, Dana, I mean, that's wonderful. And you immediately think of, <laughs> you know, all the opening of gr- openings of great novels and, and just how they plant that seed within you of 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 desire of propulsive forward desire to to read the entirety of of, of the the work what i would say is that the the sort of c- critics task comes down to two generically like divided into two possibility here are these things that you think are unalike let me show you how they're actually alike and then there's uh, here are these things that you think are alike let me show you how they're unalike and this is obviously in the former in some sense and it's a br- brilliant example of that that uh, there are you know sort of the da vinci code right like trashy lowest common denominator but even the most highbrow people i know who um read three pages of it read it till the end in a blur so there's just some quality to you know um 
a, a book like that, that 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 one could call suspense. And of course, famously, there are three page chapters, each one buttoned with a cliffhanger. Wonderfully, Catherine Schultz's piece goes into the supposed origins, perhaps origins of the word cliffhanger in a lesser known Thomas Hardy novel. That's a wonderful passage. All the way up to, you know, I mean, you know, the sort of highest of the highbrow fiction. I mean, I was thinking of, as an example, Ferrante, how in just the opening pages of the Neapolitan series, you immediately give, you know, you, you immediately give yourself over to the fates of these two, at the time, young girls, um, Lena and the narrator, and and something moves you forward. The question I have about the essay, and then, of course, Schultz moves from there into just human experience itself, right, is sort of structured as an anticipatory exercise endlessly. I mean, we're continually projecting ourselves into a into an anticipated or imagined future. And who we are, ourself literally is the kind of tension of the improbably suspended bridge, you know, over the implied amount of time to come in some sense. Like we are held in suspense aloft in a weird way and forward moving because of that power of anticipation. And I, in that sense, I think it's a wonderful piece. What I wanted more of was I love certain genre fictions like Silence of the Lambs, an absolute stone cold masterpiece. Uh, you know, the very early, early Eric Ambler spy novels are suspense novels of, you know, I mean, just like a literally a person in a hotel room having to open a drawer and take out a passport and walk out of the hotel room. Every fiber of your being seems to hang on whether or not someone will walk up behind them. How that might begin to differ and become something else when you get to something like Canalsgaard or Ferrante, is it still suspense when something about a narrative that doesn't seem to be driven by plot exigencies uh, nonetheless has a forward motion that's somehow inexorable. I mean, famously, James Wood said of Knausgaard, even when he's boring, he's not boring. And there's a mystery as to why. And just sort of generically linking that to suspense and suspense novels help us understand that? I, I'm not sure. Sh- I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, I guess that was the same question I had too. But I think I like the idea of arguing that it that it is the same thing and that actually the mechanics of making people want to know what's going to happen next and want to read the next sentence to find out are the same mechanics, whether or not there is a guy with an ax in an alley or there's just, you know, a, a phone call that might or might not happen or a, a I don't know, a, a, a cast of light on the day that might or might not look a certain way like i'm trying to think of the the least <laughs> the, the the least violent possible examples that might occur in the less lurid text um but i do i agree with you dana that the the part of the piece where she really is breaking down sentences and passages and looking at what makes them make you wonder is is the most illuminating and the most exciting and part of what's so fun about reading Catherine's work I have something to say about about that very question about you know what what about narratives that are sort of deliberately eventless could they also be suspenseful I mean this kind of goes to the the film that just won last year I think it was in the the Sight and Sound Worldwide Critics Poll won you know best film of all time and then there was a lot of discourse about that afterwards the Chantal Ackerman film Jean Dielman I won't say the whole title because I'm going to get the address wrong but you know the film I'm talking about whether you've seen it or not Jean Dielman this I believe three hour plus movie that is essentially a housewife peeling potatoes and doing household chores for 98% of the movie, then something, you know, violent and surprising does happen at the very end. But much of the movie, it's really a movie about kind of boredom and everydayness. And why am I watching this is an overwhelming feeling that one has during that movie. But that in itself is is a, a form of suspense in the same way that a sentence that makes you want to read the next sentence is a form of suspense, right? I mean, the very question why is someone telling me this story in this way is a suspenseful question. And uh, and I think a lot of the great works, I don't know about literary ones, but certainly on film, the question, why am I watching this, is a question that the viewer asks themselves in many, many great movies that are not traditionally suspenseful. Right. Well, the fact, right. Uh, one part of the piece that I love is where she talks about how a first line that's just a character in a setting, like so-and-so lived in such-and-such such place, 
because of your implied understanding that when someone starts to talk to you, that means they have something to say, sets in motion, you're wondering about like, well, what, why do they live there? And why am I being told about them? And there's an implied suspense in just the fact that someone thinks this story is worthy of your attention. That is, is one of the mechanisms that she's looking at um, and agree. I mean, we, we were all, I think, excruciatingly, agonizingly bored by um I saw the TV glow, right, a couple weeks ago. And one of the tensions and and bits of watching that was like, why, why is this like this? Why is this story being told in this way to me? Why is this so deadened? And, you know, without some of the more typical forward drivers um of a story, that was the one that actually kept my attention. All right. Well, the piece is called The Secrets of Suspense by Katherine Schultz, a staff writer at The New Yorker, Slate veteran. It's in the May 20th, 2024 issue. Uh, check it out. Let us know what you think. And now, Miss Joy LaFleur in Celebration, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Back in the 90s, Pepsi and Coca-Cola were in a heated race to try and win loyal customers by any means necessary. But when Pepsi launched an ambitious promotion that encouraged people to buy Pepsi and redeem points for prizes, they overlooked their own fine print in a major way. On each episode of Wondery's podcast, The Big Flop, comedians join host Misha Brown to chronicle one of the biggest pop culture fails of all time and try to answer the age-old question, who thought this was a good idea? Like, who at Pepsi thought it would be a good idea to advertise that people could earn enough points to redeem a military jet as a prize? When they launched their Pepsi point system, they never imagined somebody might try to actually snag it, but a 23-year-old did, and suddenly, Pepsi owed him a jet. Follow The Big Flop on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen to The Big Flop early and ad-free right now by joining Wondery+. Plus. All right, now is the moment in our podcast when we endorse Dana. What uh, what do you have? All right, well, I had this wonderful professional and personal experience last night where I got to go to Carnegie Hall, one of the greatest places to to see any sort of spectacle uh, in in New York City, and and host the conversation after this screening of the classic German silent film, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which is about to come out in a remastered, restored version with a new score by this wonderful composer, Jeff Beale, who's an Emmy-winning composer. He scored all kinds of you know famous movies, TV things, and just writes great concert music. So he wrote this new, modern, very strange and disturbing score to the great film, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari from 1920. And it premiered at Carnegie Hall last night, had its American premiere. And uh, so that was a fantastic event to be to be at. But I'm not exactly endorsing The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, though everyone who cares about film history should see it if they haven't already. But rather, this documentary that I watched in prepping for the Q&A, uh, I felt like, oh, gee, I am not an expert at all on German expressionism. I better get up to speed. And one of the things I came across in my research was this wonderful documentary from 2014 called From Caligari to Hitler, which is also the the title of a very famous work of film history. But this is not exactly an adaptation of that book. So it's called From Caligari to Hitler, German Cinema in the Age of the Masses. And it's not just about the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, but a sort of about German film between the wars and that whole Weimar era. It talks about film in this wonderfully critical way. Like I think what's so special about this documentary is it's almost entirely visually illustrated with just clips from the movies in question and uh, and interviews with the directors from that time. And then the text over it is just this wonderfully poetic, without being self-indulgent, like this great criticism. It's like a great work of visual film criticism. And it's sort of findable all over the place. I think it's on Amazon. It's on Apple TV. There might be free versions of it somewhere, though it took a little bit of of searching for me to find it. It's not on YouTube. Anyway, I'll just give the title again. And once you watch it, I guarantee you're going to want to go down a Weimar cinema rabbit hole. So from Caligari to Hitler, German cinema in the age of the masses. Oh, that's amazing. Julia, what do you have? Uh, you know, sometimes when you like something and then you see that someone else likes it and you realize that your liking of it has more significance than you thought, maybe not. <laughs> uh, no, I, no, I'm, I'm I, casting I, my mind into that. Yeah, I've had that experience. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the vindication of your own taste by someone yeah. else's approval. Yeah. So, you know, like, uh, like 
Kathy, but not Garfield. I've been trying to find ways to eat less sugar in my life. And I have always gotten stuck at peanut butter because I just fucking love Skippy Super Chunk peanut butter. It's so good. (laughs) And all of the natural ones are just like these disgusting, granular, like piles of sand with like sad layers of gross oil on top. But, but recently I discovered cream nut peanut butter by the koozie company uh and they make it in both a crunchy and a creamy variety and it is natural peanut butter with no added sugar that has the texture of normal peanut butter it's like a little bit runnier but it's just not it's like deeply non-disgusting and deeply delicious so i've been enjoying it and having it with my apples and feeling very happy about myself and then lo what did i see last week but alison roman the goddess of our kitchens herself declare that her favorite peanut butter is cream nut peanut butter by the cozy company uh so take it from me and take it from alison roman uh this is the natural peanut butter you should get i Really? I don't know. I mean, I haven't had it, but I'm a once again guy, the one with the little raccoon peeping over the words once again. Haven't tried that. Maybe I better try that. Gotta, get, gotta you, give it a put try. You, put you and Allison in a head to head contest. And that doesn't require the oil stirring, Steve? I mean, I plead the fifth on that. I mean, it, it, <laughs> you, <laughs> you got to churn a little butter. You got to churn a little to get the butter. I mean, not if you get cream nut. Then you can just pretend it's a freaking fresh off the hydrogenated line, except not. My heart's breaking. All right. Okay. So I went on a little journey to my endorsement, which is I'm a huge fan, as I think all of us probably are, of Gillian Welch, the singer-songwriter. And as I listen to her music, of course, I mean, I become, you know, by association, a fan of David Rawlings, the person with whom she makes a lot of her music. And Rawlings is, it's like they are such an incredible yin and yang or something. But he does basically is accompany her on guitar and sing harmonies. But he's a beautiful player of a very particular style. I mean, influenced by old timey and bluegrass. And he's a very precise player. But he does something that's just the hardest thing in the world, which is to be virtuosic and never show off. And he's he's so precise in the way he counterpoints what she's doing, and his vocal harmonies are quite beautiful. And I'm I just am a like like an unreservedly, you know, enthusiastic fan of his of his guitar playing. And so I went on a David Rawlings sort of deep dive and was mostly interested in just his technique and how he does it. And sort of there are videos on the web sort of trying to teach you a rudimentary version of what he's doing and deconstructing it. And because she writes in the old timey style, a lot of her songs are three chords, maybe maybe four, maybe five, but and they're very familiar progressions. And what he does is he adds these little, 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 they're grace notes, but they're dissonant, they're, they're slightly off. They work around what she's doing. Uh, as well as with it. Um, They're so perfectly beautiful. And in search of yet more about them, I came across a 2020 Times Magazine profile of them called How Gillian Welch and David Rawlings Held On to Optimism During COVID by the journalist, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce his name, Hanif Abderakib. And it is such a beautiful piece of writing, and it gets at exactly this, like, deeply mutually insinuated organic symbiosis that the two of them have created musically and what it meant for him coming out of COVID to see them play live. And um, it, it's just beautifully written and it gets at, at, at a musical thing that like if you said, oh, I love Gillian Welch or I like what she does with Dave, David Rawlings, you might not because what he does is so subtle and so counterpointing to what's dominantly beautiful about the songs with songwriting and her singing, you might not quite notice. Um, so we'll link to both the piece and uh, maybe a video, a how-to video, uh, David Rawlings, and and maybe three or four of my favorite songs that, that, that uh, depict this, demonstrate this. Anyway, Julia, thank you so much. Thanks, Steve. Dana, a pleasure, a fun show. Thank you. It was a good one. Thank you. Yeah, you'll find links to some of the things we talked about today at our show page. That's slate.com slash culturefest. And you can email us at culturefest at slate.com. 
Our introductory music is by the composer Nicholas Bertel. Our production assistant is Kat Hong. Our producer is Jared Downing for Dana Stevens and Julia Turner. I'm Stephen Metcalf. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you soon. Hi, I'm Josh Levine. My podcast, The Queen, tells the story of Linda Taylor. She was a con artist, a kidnapper, and maybe even a murderer. She was also given the title The Welfare Queen, and her story was used by Ronald Reagan to justify slashing aid to the poor. Now, it's time to hear her real story. Over the course of four episodes, you'll find out what was done to Linda Taylor, what she did to others, and what was done in her name. The, the great lesson of this uh, for me is that people will come to their own conclusions based on what their prejudices are. Subscribe to The Queen on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening right now.